Caltech in 1992, and today he'll be talking to us about uh, a couple of different topics. First lecture is be focused on density functional theory, and then later this morning we'll be getting on to how these calculations are impacting uh, nano PV. Good morning, everybody. I, I, I know that people don't like using the mic. I'm one of those people. Can you guys in the back hear me, or should I try using the mic? Ryan says, oh, thumbs up. Okay. If I start to, like, get sleepy myself and drift off quietly, then tell me, and I'll talk louder, okay? But uh, the mic tends to either be too loud or not loud enough. Uh, I'm going to give you guys three lectures in the next two days. I'm sorry about that. It's Yao's fault entirely. And... And uh, the first lecture, I'm going to talk about density functional theory because uh, it's the method of choice, at least for our group, in looking at excited state dynamics. And I want to explain why that's a, a, a starting point. It's not a finishing point. Um, then the, the second lecture I'll give you after we have a break and get some coffee um, will be about uh, more sophisticated many-body methods, in particular uh, perturbation theory on the many-body scale leading to uh, GW theory and beta saltpeter theory, BSE equation. And then I'll uh, use that to look at exciton uh, dynamics. And so I'm looking at excitons hopping, like this picture shows you. Um, yeah, it's an artist's sketch, but it's, it's an exciton, let me get my pointer. It's an exciton hopping uh, drawn as a green blob uh, between the quantum dots there after the sunlight hits on it. So um, this, is the, this is where we're headed this morning is uh, looking at exciton dynamics between these quantum dots. Uh, but before we get there, I have to talk about um, a little about uh, density functional theory. Okay, so where am I at? I'm at the Colorado School of Mines. Here's a shameless plug. Please come visit us. Um, it's 20 miles down south. I think a couple of our speakers and some of our audience are from there. And uh, we have a good physics program with a strong emphasis in condensed matter and in particular photovoltaics. Uh, if you're a grad student, think about us for a postdoc. If you're a postdoc, think about us for a faculty position. If you're an undergrad, grad school, you get the idea. Okay. Um, so what do I want to uh, start with? I want to start by making sure that you know um, kind of the, the setting, that I, how I think of these things. Of course, here, you've been fed this for three weeks now. Uh, you have some semiconductor, let's say silicon. That's what we work with a lot. You've got a band gap of 1.1 EV. Uh, the photon comes down, if it's at right at 1.1 eV, it excites an electron into the conduction band, and now we have this electron and hole. And this is a picture um, that I hope you guys are very familiar with. Is that true? If you're not, you know, let me uh, pretend this is a clicker question. Hold up your virtual clicker. How many people are familiar with this picture? Okay, good. All right, about two-thirds of that. The idea here is that all of these are occupied energy levels representing all the electrons in this valence band. And if one of the electrons gets excited into the conduction band, it leaves a hole. And I'm not drawing all of the occupied valence state electrons. I'm just drawing the hole in red and the electron in blue. Okay? Okay. So what, what can happen here? The, the photon comes in with exactly the right energy. You have 1.1 electron volts for silicon to excite this electron and hole. Um, I'll talk in the second lecture a good bit about excitons, but this electron and hole together, um, we call that an exciton. It's a quasi particle. And here it sits, the exciton, okay, in the silicon um, crystal as drawn in 2D. And then some things can happen. One thing that can happen is nothing. It just you know, fluoresces and they recombine and you get the photon back out again. Another thing that happen is that the, uh, the electron and hole separate, right? And you get a, a current that forms. The third thing that could happen is that the quasi-particle itself, the exciton, moves. And so these are all possibilities and ones that computationally we have to take into account. We need to know the relative rates and they're all competing, right? What else could happen if the if the exciton is of a higher energy, if the electron gets excited up into the, one of the higher energy uh, states, then it can thermalize, and it can thermalize in a couple of ways. It can, it can share its uh, phonon energy with other phonon modes in the 
uh, nanostructure that you're looking at, or the nanostructure itself can share energy with, by collisions with the nanostructures, molecules, quantum dots around it. Okay? So in any case, it thermalizes down to the conduction band and all that energy is, is lost to heat. Uh, another thing it can do, and you'll hear a good bit about this today, um, uh, mostly not from me, is that uh, the conduction band electron can go through an inverse OJ process and it can excite a second electron from the valence band up into the conduction band. And now you have these two electron hole pairs that's a bi exciton. Okay? And in that case, you, uh, you can think of this as kind of like from a billiard ball perspective, is as a high energy electron smacks into a, an electron that's sitting there at rest and it, it makes it start moving. Okay? And this is a, a way of um, capturing more of that hot electron energy instead of letting it thermalize. Okay? This goes by many names, impact ionization, carrier multiplication, uh, multiple exciton generation, this sort of thing. Okay? So, we have all these different competing processes, and this is a nice uh, chart that Alberto Francis Ketty uh, had in one of his nanoletter papers uh, that kind of summarizes what's going on. So here's the original chart that I showed you, the energy level diagram, a hot electron, a hot hole, and if you have the impact ionization or this multiple exon generation, that might happen in around a tenth of a picosecond. This is for a particular type of quantum dot, but this is just to get a sense of time scales. You could have an impact ionization, so you make multiple exons here. You could have, subsequently, you could have the uh, electron cooling or the hole cooling. This is on the order of picoseconds. You could have the opposite process, the inverse inverse OJ, which we call the OJ process. That could happen about, in about 20 seconds, uh, 20 picoseconds. And then you could have the subsequent electron cooling again. Okay, so these are all different ideas, and they're to give you a sense of the, um, of the types of processes that we need to compute. And we want to compute these very short time scale processes, and then we want to design our system so that we emphasize the ones that we want to keep. For instance, we want to be able to separate charge and have it move to a uh, collection facility, right? But we uh, and we don't want it to photoluminesce, we don't want it to thermalize, if possible, this sort of thing. Okay, so we want to design systems um, with these relaxation rates in mind. Now the approach that uh, Mike group uses is density functional theory. And I know there are, there are many different approaches to calculating these many body states. Let me emphasize many body, I've been drawing these pictures of the energy levels, and of course that's a nice picture, but that's not really how these things are, right? The, the wave functions are inherently uh, many body objects and it's just kind of a, a nice thought process to think of them as uh, each of these energy levels is being occupied by a particular particle. That's not actually so. Um, in density functional theory, this is a particularly important point because density functional theory is a ground state theory. It only tells you how all of those valence bands are going to be occupied. It doesn't tell you anything about the conduction band. Well, it, it kind of does. It, it makes a guess, but uh, strictly speaking, it's out of its uh, range of uh, theory to be able to predict what the excited states are. Okay? On the other hand, we're, we're looking at excited states. So here I want to teach you a ground state theory and use it for excited states. That's not going to work. So we supplement the density functional theory with green function methods, uh, GW theory, BSE, and I will talk about those. This first lecture, though, is just about density functional theory. Uh, these uh, lecture notes will be, uh, the PDFs will be online, you guys can download these. Uh, I want to uh, point out that there are some nice books that you ought to get, and so you can get these off of the PDFs. Um, this book by uh, Par and Yang is great, it's a, uh, kind of a, a molecular approach to density functional theory. Uh, Richard Martin's book on electronic structure theory is also very good. And then it, this book on computational physics by Thiessen, it's not about density functional theory. It's just computational physics in general. But if you want a great introduction to density functional theory that doesn't blow you away with the math, but just kind of goes through stuff in 20 pages, um, that's, a, that's a good book. Okay. So he's his book on computational physics. There are also some nice free resources uh, on the archive that you can download. These are essentially books in themselves uh, that I think are very good. There's, there's also a couple of books that are, I think, 
uh, must-haves in this area. These aren't on density functional theory, but they're definitely related, and a lot of the concepts in them are used in density functional theory. The Atkins and Freeman book on uh, um, quantum mechanics is great. And uh, does anyone, how many people have this book by Zabo and Austin? <laughs> wow, only not here. Okay, so, so <laughs> this is a great book. Go out and buy it right away during the break. Okay, this is, this is a good book. If you're, if you're studying anything to do with uh, many body physics, you should have this book as a reference. Uh, it's, uh, and it's cheap too, so yeah. Okay, so what I want to talk about next is a motivation for density functional theory. And it doesn't look like density functional theory or Schrodinger's equation at all, at all on account of it's not. I, this is M, F equals MA. Okay, so we're back to kind of classical physics for a second. And I want to study uh, a bunch of particles. And so I tell you the sum of the forces on particle M is equal to the mass times acceleration. Okay? And I want to study that. Well, I can do that for 10 particles, 100 particles. I can do that for, you know, 1,000 particles. In fact, in this simulation, it's a little, it's a little hard to see, but I'll, it, I'll just tell you what it says. This is a, um, a system of two dissimilar um, sets of atoms, okay, two metals. And it's at a very high temperature. Um, this one is copper, and, and this one's aluminum. And the temperature is uh, 2,000 degrees Kelvin. And they're going to move like this. Okay? And they're going to move and they're going to set up a, a turbulent layer on the interface. And this is a, a study that was done with 9 billion um, particles. Okay? So 9 billion atoms using F equals MA. And I want to show you how this, this works. So let's see. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. This is not Livermore. I just want to kind of scan down here to about here. Okay, so this is running F equals MA for 9 billion particles. Okay, and it looks pretty good. This is blowing up just the interface. Can you picture that between these two layers that are being sheared? And it looks kind of like um, a wave in one of those oil things that rocks back and forth, right? So if you blow it up though, now focus on this area, and you get close enough, you can see the particles. Okay? But from a distance, it just looks like a fluid. Okay? So you can see that there's this, this discrete nature to the system, but there's a fluid nature to it that is more important in terms of what we're trying to get out, just understanding the physics of this, of this flow. <coughs> okay. Why do I tell you that? Because computationally, running a simulation like that on 9 billion particles so that you can watch a wave develop is a pretty intense way of, of doing business, and maybe there's a better way of doing business. And it's, it's something like this. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, <laughs> nodding heads already. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's, that's good. Is that good for you guys? Okay, thanks. So, okay, stop. All right, so, so, so here's another way of doing business. This is F equals MA, but now it's written in terms of a continuum field. So we've lost the identity of each of the individual particles, and we've replaced the mass with a mass field, a density field. Rho here is a function of position and time. And so now, this is a single field that I'm going to track. And so I'm looking at the time rate of change of momentum of this field. This is a material derivative. And it's balanced by the forces. But now, remember, this is on a, a per unit volume basis. And so there's a body force here. And then there's a divergence of a stress tensor. This is a contact. You can think of this as T as a, as a matrix. And when you multiply it by a normal to a surface, it gives you the traction on the surface. And the divergence of that gives you a force. Okay, So this is F equals MA for a field. What's the advantage of looking at this system instead of the 9 billion particle system? Well, in this system, I may still solve this, say, with finite difference techniques, but the grid that I apply isn't a, uh, imposed by the particles. It's not a, seri a, a system of, of particles with F equals MA. It's a grid that I impose and that has the, the resolution that I need in order to pull out the physics that I'm interested in. And so it can be much coarser than the particle grid, if you think of the individual particles as being on the grid. Okay, so let's see how this works.
It's a different simulation, but I, it's to get the, just to give you the idea. Remember now, this is not a system of particles. This is just plotting a density field as a function of time. But you get the sense that it's telling you the same kind of thing, right? So here we have particle versus field. Discrete versus continuum, and the continuum looks pretty good. And what have I done? I've gotten rid of the particle and I've introduced a density. Okay. All right. So the individual mass is replaced by a fluid density. Rho is the relevant field. It's simpler to solve this one 3D problem than it is to solve 3N coupled ordinary differential equations because I can change the grid. Okay. Is it is it uh, a first principles concept? Well, no, no. I still need to tell you what the stress tensor is. Remember, here's that equation. I need to tell the body forces are things like gravity. Maybe I know that. But the T here is, is going to be a functional of the density. The, you could think of this as the pressure in the simplest case. It's a functional of the density. Think ideal gas law. I have to tell you what the law is, what the constitutive relationship is between the density and the force. And that constitutive theory I have to bring to the table. So after I tell you what the principle is, I have to tell you something that characterizes the material. Okay? How does this work in a, in a setting that we're interested in, quantum mechanics? Well, maybe I could do something similar to this. Dynamic equations recast in terms of fluid density. Well, I'll use something else instead of fluid density, maybe electron density. Um, that's what the electronic structure calculations will give me. And is this a first principles idea, or is there a constitutive theory associated with it? So first, a, a, quick, a quick check. How many of you have heard of density functional theory? Okay, how many of you have heard density functional theory is a first principles or ab initio theory? Okay, like four of you. All right, so, so generally, people in my business that do density functional theory like to say it's first principles, as if it's, you know, it was on a stone tablet or something. This is the, the, the bedrock on which all physics is based. Well, it turns out it's not really true, and I want to show you why I say that. Okay, it's not really a first principles calculation, even though we tend to say that a lot. Okay, there's still a constitutive theory associated with that. Um, in the, um, the mathy parts of the slides that I'll show you, um, I've gotten rid of uh, some of the uh, key quantities like H bar, you know, mass of electron, and the charge, just by using atomic units. Okay? So, you won't see any, you shouldn't see any H bars floating around in here or electron masses. And now I want to do something just like we did with the computational fluid dynamics with the, uh, uh, the mass density. I want to do the same kind of thing, but I want to do it with Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so how does this, how does this work? First we start with the non-relativistic time dependent spinless Schrodinger equation. Can I generalize all that? Yeah, but let's use this as something to hang our hats on. Here we are. Okay, so is this, is this notation freaky and odd for you guys, or are you feeling pretty at home? How many people understand? What is H? Yeah, you, you know. You're not allowed to answer. You're not allowed to answer. What? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. What is it? The Hamiltonian system, sure, and I've written it with a little hat meaning that it is an operator, okay? And this is a ket for the wave function, a many-body wave function, a function of, um, uh, that will, if I write it in real space, a function of many different positions, okay? But not time, I've tossed that out, and E here is the energy of the system. And so this is an eigenvalue problem, and I want to solve this eigenvalue problem, but the problem is that H is a pretty complicated object. Here's H, it has kinetic energy, and it has two types of potential energies, one is an external potential, which could be, you know, the body force idea like gravity. But here, mostly what we're thinking of is it's the, uh, the potential associated with the nuclei on the electrons. Okay, so this is going to lead to forces on the electrons from the nuclei, okay, Coulombic attraction. And then I have electron-electron interactions, just Coulombic uh, interactions here between the uh, electrons. And so R is the position of the electrons, and this is just a bunch of pair potentials. Okay. So here's H. That goes into this equation. I want to solve this for you know, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 electrons. 
there's another little glitch to this, or another thing I have to keep in mind, is that the wave function is anti-symmetric, right? This is from what? Where does that come from? Why, why does the wave function have to be anti-symmetric? What does that mean, anti-symmetric? Maybe that's a better question. There are such two particles that they combine to something. Okay, so if I take two particles and I say turn around and then I swap their position, then you shouldn't be able to tell anything about the physics that's different. The wave function can change signs. We're an anti-symmetric system. Okay? The probability density, that's the product of the wave function with its, with its conjugate, won't change at all. Okay? The minus sign will go away. So anti-symmetry is associated with the Pauli exclusion principle. And it says that two fermions can't occupy the same state. And the, an anti-symmetric wave function like this satisfies that requirement. Okay? So in addition to solving this eigenvalue problem, as hard as it is, I have to make sure that I solve it with a wave function that's anti-symmetric. Well, that sounds, sounds kind of hard. It is kind of hard. So we don't do it. That's what density functional theory is all about. We, we find out that that's a pretty hard prospect and we try to do something else. So here's what we do. I'm gonna show this slide twice. Okay, first, um, kind of before talking about the density functional theory and then afterwards, all right? So first of all, this is no density functional theory. This is just solve the Schrodinger equation. We have a whole bunch of electrons and that pair potential between the electrons, the Coulomb interaction, are all these double lines, okay? And Here's the Hamiltonian that I told you about. Now, what I want to do is trade that in. Remember the fluid dynamics picture. I want to trade that in on a system like this, okay? Now, the system like this, I've taken all those little pair potentials and I've kind of smeared them out, and I want to just look at the density of the electrons. So what I want to do is smear out these electrons. However, this is quantum mechanics, okay? So I can't just focus on the, the uh, electron density, I have to also think about the orbits involved. Remember those little energy levels in the energy diagram? And in order to do that, I'm going to use orbits here, little quasi particles, sorry, um, cone sham particles. That's what the KS is. These are fictitious particles that are going to be representing the, uh, the uh, eigenfunctions that solve the governing eigenvalue problem. Okay? So here's what I want you to think about. This cone sham particle and this cone sham particle don't care at all about each other. They're just drifting around. All they care about is the mean field around them. Okay, so this particle moves based on what it feels around itself. It doesn't move because of anything associated with this particle. Okay, that's a much better system because now if I can focus on the dynamics of these particles, they're all just kind of short-sighted and mean field oriented. All they have to do is, is kind of pulse their environment right around themselves and figure out where they're going to go. If I can write the electron density in terms of these particles, then it turns out I can do a lot with that electron density. I can characterize the properties of the system. And so I need to tell you how to link these cone sham particles to the wave function. Okay? In particular here, here's the wave function. This wave function is going to be an anti-symmetric wave function associated with all of these cone sham states. Now, here's the part where I'm a little worried about losing some of it, okay? This phi one, phi two, phi three, this is a, a series of states, okay? And they're associated, one is associated with each of these particles. And A just stands for anti-symmetric. And I'm gonna replace the Hamiltonian with a kinetic energy of the cone sham particles and a potential energy of the cone sham particles. I want to make sure that you understand this idea of anti-symmetry because it's kind of important here. When I write the wave function as the anti-symmetric operator on this, on this set of states, what I mean is that, and I know that you've seen this before, I heard a talk, uh, I think a, a week or so ago, where this was introduced to you. Do you guys remember this, a Slater determinant idea? Okay, so this wave function is a Slater determinant of all the little uh, c's here, the size. Okay? And this Slater determinant guarantees anti-symmetry. So when I write A, what I mean is this. Now, 
Density functional theory is a single determinant theory, just like hartree fock theory. That's a problem. So I'm going to assume that the wave function looks like this, but it really doesn't. Okay, the wave function is actually a, an infinite sum of these. And so if this is the wave function for, a, for density functional theory, I could go up. And this, this notation means everywhere I have an A state, like here, would have been the A state, I replace it with the R state. Here, I replace A and B with R and S, and so on. I could have three states, four states being replaced. And then I look at a series of Slater determinants, and then I have a variational principle where I figure out what these coefficients are. I minimize an expected value of an energy with these coefficients. And that is the configuration interaction approach, full CI approach. Okay? In our method, we're just going to use one of these Slater determinants. I tell you that because density functional theory is not going to give us exactly the right answer. Okay? It's just going to give us a, an estimate for the answer. Okay. There's two theorems associated with density functional theory that I want you to, to have a sense of. I'm not going to prove them. I, I, I'm not going to go through a bunch of math. I just want you to have a sense of what underlies density functional theory. It's these two ideas. One is this. It, it's something, it sounds a little strange. I'll say it this way. The, if I know the electron density, I can tell you what the external potential is. I can tell you what all the interactions are external to the electron system within an additive constant. It doesn't really matter. That's kind of like saying, if I listen to everyone in the room, then I can tell you everything about the room. I can explain the entire structure of the room based on just the listening. The listening is like the electron density. The structure is like the whole potential. Okay? So this is kind of surprising. It's backwards from what you normally think. You normally think of, of everything in the room tells me what the, the noise is. Okay? Everything in the room tells me what the noise is. Now I'm doing it just the opposite way. You tell me the noise, I'll tell you everything in the room. Okay? If I told you the external potential in Schrodinger's equation, that's the only thing that changes. When you learn quantum mechanics, introductory quantum mechanics, the first time, the only thing, you went through a series of, of calculations and you looked at like an infinite square well or harmonic potential and right, a, a little finite square well. All you did was change the external potential each time. So if you tell me the external potential, I'll tell you the wave function. So now we have this. Rho tells me the external potential. The external potential tells me the wave function. But the wave function determines all the properties because all the expected values are expected values based on the wave function in some operator. So Rho determines V. V determines Psi. Psi determines all the properties of the system. Psi even determines the Hamiltonian. And so the Hamiltonian can be expressed as a functional of the electron density. That's the first Hellenberg cone theorem. That's important. It doesn't tell you how to do it, but it does say that it's possible. You and me and a cup of coffee, maybe we could figure out how to come up with a, a Hamiltonian description just in terms of electron density. At least we know it's out there. Okay? What's a functional? Just I use this word a lot, density functional theory and Hamiltonian functional of rho. We write functionals with a bracket. And what we mean is not a function. So f of x equals x squared, then f of 2 equals 4. That's a function of x. Capital F, a functional of f, means there's some operation involving that function. And you tell me the function, and I'll tell you the number. And so f of x squared is equal to 1 third. Make sense? That's a functional. And so density functional theory, the reason we call it that is because the Hamiltonian is a functional of an unknown electron density. That's what we're going to do. So, what is the functional for the Hamiltonian? No one, no one knows. It's not, it's not predetermined. The Hohenberg cone theorems don't tell you. The first Hohenberg cone theorem just tells you there is a functional, H, a functional of rho. The second Hohenberg cone theorem doesn't tell you the functional either. All it says is that if you have the functional, then there's a variational principle that you can invoke. And it goes like this. If you know H is a functional 
of rho, then you can set up the expected value of H, and that's guaranteed to be greater than the ground state energy of the system. So you tell me some arbitrary electron density, you put it into your functional, you get the expected value of the energy, and it's guaranteed to be an upper bound on the energy. That means that I can go through and I can make better, better and better guesses of rho until I get tired of finding ones that are smaller and smaller. And the smallest one is my best estimate for the ground state energy of the system, and that also tells me what the best value of rho is. Well, we don't go around guessing like that. Instead, in a variational, once you have a variational principle, what you do is take the variational derivative of this energy. You take the variational derivative of this energy, the specter rho, and you set it equal to zero. You look for a minimum in the in extremum in this energy functional. And that gives you something called the Euler-Lagrange equations. That's a necessary condition for satisfying your extremum. And in this case, the resultant equation is the Cohn-Sham equation, the density functional theory equation. So it goes like this. Remember this picture? Okay. Here's the, the actual wave function. Here's the actual Hamiltonian. I'm going to replace the wave function with a single determinant. I'm going to replace the Hamiltonian with some Cohn-Sham potential. I don't know what it is. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that the electron density is a sum of a whole bunch of orbitals, phi times their complex conjugate. So here's the electron density. Notice that it's not a Slater determinant anymore. I'm just going to write it like this. I'm going to write the Cohn-Sham potential as the nuclei interaction, <coughs> the Hartree interaction, which is a mean field Coulomb interaction, an exchange correlation interaction, which is the sweeping under the rug of all the stuff I don't know. Okay, so this is just a big unknown function, everything else. And I'm going to take the variational derivative of the total energy, and I'm going to set it equal to zero. And I'm going to look at the necessary condition that comes out, this Euler-Lagrange equation, and it's this. And it kind of looks familiar. It looks like a Schrodinger equation, but it's not. This is the kinetic energy of the Cohn-Sham particles. This is the potential energy of the Cohn-Sham particles, a functional of rho. Here it is. Okay? And if I solve this, I'll get the Cohn-Sham particles, eigenfunctions. If I know those, I can put them up here and get the electron density. If I know the electron density, I know the Hamiltonian. If I know the Hamiltonian, I know all the um, observables of the system. I know the energies here. Those are those gray energy levels that I showed on the first slide at the top. So that's the Cohn-Sham equation. And it's all based on knowing the Cohn-Sham potential. And the Cohn-Sham potential is the nuclei here. The Hartree, that's just the mean field Coulomb interaction. We know that. And this exchange correlation interaction, which we have no idea about. So here's what we've done. We said, all I need is this one thing, and I, and I, I know how to solve the Cohn-Sham equations, but I don't know what that thing is. How do we get that? We need the exchange energy, and we need the Coulomb energy. How many people know this phrase, hartree fock theory? Does that ring any bells? Yeah, a couple of you. Okay. So, see, I, I don't know what your background is, and I know it's, it's quite mixed, but let me, let me tell you that hartree fock is, is an approach that doesn't have some things that density functional theory has. It doesn't have any correlation energy. But it does a really good job, an exact job, at getting what we call the exchange energy. And if you think of exchange energy from maybe your intro quantum mechanics, it goes something like this. If I have um, two particles, I can say that they're distinguishable, or I can say that they're indistinguishable. And if they're indistinguishable, they can be fermions or they can be bosons. And if I account for the indistinguishability in the energy, this difference between the, the energy of two particles that are distinguishable and the energy of two particles that are indistinguishable is the exchange energy. It's the exchange force that gives you the energy. And so here's distinguishable, D-I-S-T. Here's the wave function of a distinguishable set of particles. And the expected value of the energy gives me this expression. J is just a Coulomb um, energy. So you can calculate this. If I instead take this anti-symmetric product of these states, 
and I calculate the expected value of the energy, I haven't done anything different, same Hamiltonian, then I get a different expected value of the energy. The Hamiltonian's the same, but I get this additional term. This additional term is the exchange energy. And it doesn't come out of DFT. Why? Because I don't, I don't use this. Sorry, I don't use this assumption in DFT. I do use it in high free fog. So what I'm going to have to do is put in a potential into this this cone champ potential that accounts for the exchange energy in some rough way. What's the correlation energy? It's this. I take the total energy, I subtract off the exchange energy, and all the stuff that's left in my hartree fock approach, I'll call the correlation energy. So if I take the full CI, this full configuration interaction that I mentioned, all the sum of Slater determinants, and I calculate the total energy of the system, and I subtract off the hartree fock energy that accounts for exchange, everything else is correlation energy. And I would like to include the correlation energy in my <coughs> calculations. So here's what we do. In a local, there's a couple of key types of density functional theory. One of them is called local density approximation. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. There's also a generalized gradient approximation and many other uh, approximations as well. The local density approximation goes like this. I'm going to take an electron gas, homogeneous electron gas, and I'm going to calculate everything about the dynamics of the homogeneous electron gas. And then I'm going to look at a system with a whole bunch of atoms and electrons zooming around them. And I'm going to say that the electrons zooming around, all they care about is the local electron density. And if, if it's the same as that of an electron gas, then I know the dynamics of that electron because all it sees is an electron gas around it. That's the local density approximation. The local electron density is all that matters. Well, for electron gas, you can derive the exchange energy exactly. Dirac did it a long time ago. Okay, so I have this, um, well, that should just be an X. Okay? The exchange energy, the B exchange, and that's exchange here, just X. Okay? Should be like this. Now, the correlation potential, there isn't an exact expression for it, but you can do a quantum Monte Carlo calculation for an electron gas and let all the electrons zoom around and you can calculate the correlation energy. And the way you do that is calculate the Hartree approximation, the configuration interaction, and take the difference between them. And you get this, a big bunch of results that you end up uh, fitting. And you fit it, this wouldn't be the first function that we would come up with, but this is a function that works pretty well. And it's just an empirical fit to the Monte Carlo calculation, and I can stick that EC into my expression for the correlation potential. So here's how this works, okay? I'm going to take the correlation energy from electron gas. I'm going to take the exchange energy that Dirac derived for electron gas. I'm going to put them into this potential for the, the Cohn-Sham um, exchange correlation energy. And then I'm going to make a wild guess for the electron density. I just <coughs> guess one. Okay? And maybe I can, based on where the atoms are, I can make a pretty good guess for the electron density. Then I put the electron density into the Cohn-Sham equation. Now, the electron density, remember, can be a function of position. The brackets mean a function. Now I solve this eigenvalue problem. I solve it, and once I have the phi's, I'm going to go back a couple of slides. Once I have all the eigenfunctions, then I can build the electron density. Once I have the electron density, I can say, OK, is that what my guess was for the electron density? And usually the answer is, no, not even close. Okay? If it's not, then I go back, and I put my new electron density into the cone champ potential. And I solve the eigenvalue problem again. This is called the self-consistent loop. SCF, self-consistent field, is what people tend to call this. And you go around and around. Sometimes I'll do this loop on my calculations, um, oh, like maybe a thousand times, but usually it's maybe 10 or 15 times, until the electron density doesn't change very much. So this is a way of solving a nonlinear equation. This is an inherently nonlinear equation for phi. Right? Because phi is in here in rho, and phi is also here. So it's a trick that mathematicians use for solving nonlinear equations. In fact, 
just a computational note, if I take my guess for fee and get a new guess for row and get a new row, and I put my new row back into this equation, it almost always blows up. So what I do is I take my new row, just a little piece of it, and mix it with the old row, mix the two together, and then put that guess back into the cone sham equation and solve the eigenvalue problem again. In fact, uh, calculations I have running right now, how much of this new row did I do I use in my calculations? Two percent, three percent. So a teeny bit. So I'm just kind of massaging this into a solution for self-consistency. Then once I get out the the row for a fixed set of atom positions, I use the Hellman-Feynman theorem. Hellman-Feynman theorem says this. I'm paraphrasing. We all know that there's no such thing as force in quantum mechanics. Right? There's no energy to take a derivative. There's only expected values. But if I think of the force on atom M as being minus the gradient of the energy with respect to the change in position of that atom, right? force is equal minus the gradient of the energy, classically, the expected value of the energy here, this this ratio is also equal to, or this derivative is also equal to the expected value of the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the position of the atom. So this is the Hellman-Feynman theorem. It's a way of calculating forces, classical idea, forces on atoms even though there really isn't a force on the atom. In fact, the Hamiltonian I know from Schrodinger's equation, I can take the derivative analytically and so here's the derivative, and I can write it just in terms of things that I know. Oh, I think there's supposed to be a row here. I don't see it. There should be a row right there. So I, I calculate this force once I know row. That tells me the force on each atom. And then I move all the atoms so as to reduce the force. So I move them all one step, maybe like a tenth of an angstrom. I move all the atoms. Okay? And so as to reduce the force. And then I go back and I check all the forces. Okay? I check the, the forces and I say, how much did the what, are the, what are the forces on the system now? If that force is above some threshold that I set, I have to go all the way back to the previous slide, now with new atomic positions, and do this another thousand times. Maybe. Okay? And then I come here and I update the force with Hellman-Feynman and I move the atoms again. So this is a big loop, external loop, and the previous one is a little internal loop that I do. So there's a little loop here, and then there's a big loop here for the geometry optimization. Okay, that's the density functional theory. Um, there are all sorts of extensions. We can talk about delta FCF for excited states, ensemble density functional theory, density functional mean field theory, density functional LDA plus U, where I bring in this empirical uh, piece of the potential people refer to as you. There's orbital dependent density functional theory. There's time dependent density functional theory. There's a lot of different density <coughs> functional theories and the research is, is on and on and on in this area. I just talked about one little teeny piece. Here's what we did. We took the many body Schrodinger equation, we replaced the electron with a single particle cone sham idea and we have a cone sham equation. We have two loops. We have the self-consistent loop and we have the geometry optimization loop is this an ab initio theory? Back to my original question. Is this first principles? No. The local density approximation that I showed you is not a first principles type even. What did we do? How did, how did we get the local density approximation? We assumed an electron gas and we did a Monte Carlo calculation on electron gas and we fit the results and stuck it in here. So it's not fair to call this an ab initio theory. What kind of scaling do you have here? It scales with the number of electrons or plane waves, if you want to think of it in terms of plane waves, about n to the cube. Some people say there are order of n linear scaling techniques, and there are, it's just they're pretty specialized. And what they amount to is taking advantage of kind of a myopic nature to the, uh, the system and making approximations when you diagonalize the, the Hamiltonian matrix. How many atoms can you look at? Thousands to tens of thousands of atoms. The calculations that I have running right now are yeah, a couple thousand atoms, and that's pretty typical. Another shameless plug, I work 
uh, in a center called the Golden Energy Computing Organization. I also work in our Renewable Energy Center, our NSF sponsored center on photovoltaics. And these two are the ones that sponsor the, the research that I do. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Nick, what's the format? Questions or escape? Yep. Or Any questions? I'm a little worried that I just threw up a whole bunch of bath slides and you guys were like, when's it going to be over? Is that, <laughs> is that true or possible? Because I, I know that like even Slater Determinant and things like that, anti-symmetry probably kind of threw you for a loop. Yeah, Matt. Um, seems like there's a lot of uh, approximations, so how do you know the answer? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess you don't know for sure. Um, what you can do is you can compare um, with, on small systems, you can compare with exact approaches where you're solving Schrodinger's equation exactly, right, on, on systems with only a few electrons. Um, you can compare your results with a uh, safer structure, take geometry optimization. This would predict a certain bond length between two atoms. Am I getting the right bond length? So that would be a, a way of checking. Um, energy of the system, ionization potential, electron affinities, these are things that the theory predicts that you can check quantitatively with experimental results. And so I, I suppose the proof is in the comparison with experiment. I mean, that's the right answer, and uh, people have done that. Uh, it uh, works quite well in these ground state results. But what does quite well mean? Chemical accuracy is what you're shooting for. Um, you know, what's that? Uh, I guess I'd say something like a, a kcal per mole. And density functional theory, I think, has a you know, 0.01 electron volt or so. Uh, density functional theory, that's pushing it to say that it has chemical accuracy. In fact, I, I'd say uh, sometimes it does, but a lot of times it doesn't. So I'd, I'd say you're, you're on that threshold of the 1 k cal per mole. I killed them. Can you come over here? Yeah. When I have a crystal structure, so it's all formed by the equation, and I can also put this structure today. Wait, I'm sorry. You're going to have to speak a little louder. I'm sorry. When I have a crystal structure, because uh -huh. I solved it by, let's say, um, uh, crystal structure, crystal structure, crystal structure, crystal structure, crystal structure, then I can also put it into the DC calculation. Yeah. And um, would you perform a, a, a geometry optimization uh, despite the fact that I already know how it looks like? I would. I would. Um, so the, the question is, if I, if I have a crystal structure and I do XRD on it, I know exactly what this system looks like, the bond lengths, the orientations, right? Then why do DFT at all? Right? That's, I think, your question. So uh, I think this comes back to, to Matt's point, for instance. Um, I could use your data to check my ability to predict that structure, right? But then I might ask you, okay, now maybe that was a silicon structure. Now I'm going to tell you that it's going to be a geranium silicon alloy or something, right? And now I want to know what the crystal structure is. Well, maybe that's harder for you to do, especially locally, to see how the geranium and, allo uh, geranium and silicon um, tend to work together. And that's something that I could then, with confidence, because I've checked it against your homogeneous silicon structure, <coughs> I could proceed to look at, at this alloy system. And it's not just the crystal structure. I mean, it's the energies involved. It's the dynamics, what I'll talk about next. It's actually more interesting. Yeah? This is kind of like along the same question as Matt, but what about I mean, the difference between a local minimum and a global minimum? Um, yeah, you, you don't know. I mean, it, one of the things that's true is uh, if you take, uh, I'll tell you how I do it. If I take a, a system, maybe I'm looking at a, a nanostructure, you know, quantum dot, and it's got some interesting ligands on it, and I do an energy minimization. Uh, it could be that this is not a global minimum. And so one of the things that I tend to do is do a lousy MD calculation, a quantum MD calculation, where I'll shake this thing, basically perturb it, okay? And you're doing this rough annealing is what it amounts to. And bad MD makes good MC. You know, you, you have a, you're looking at a lot of different possible trial configurations. And then you um, cool it down 
and then you do the DFT again and see if it doesn't uh, settle into a, something that you might expect to be a global minimum. You can't, you can't tell from the geometry optimization. What else? Yeah? Why does DFT tend to underestimate band gaps? Why does DFT tend to underestimate band gaps? Um, yeah, it's, it's true. Um, I'll talk about that actually next, next lecture. I'll show you some examples of that. But it, in short, it amounts to the fact that the, um, it assumes that there's a continuous derivative in a place where there really isn't a continuous derivative. Um, it, is, it does not take into account the discrete nature of the charges. And so there's a place between the conduction and, sorry, the valence and conduction bands uh, where there's a, a jump, there's a discontinuity in the slope of a function, and DFT doesn't take that into account. Um, another way of saying that is um, there are exchange and correlation effects that DFT does a poor job at. But let, let's ask that question again in the next, when I talk about the quasi particle methods, okay? Okay, with that, let's take a quick break and reconvene at 9.30.